Section 1.3 is Design of Experiments. The objectives that we will cover in this lesson are to be able to distinguish between a randomized experiment and an observational study, to understand the advantages of randomized experiments, and understand how confounding can affect the results of an observational study. We'll also learn how to describe various types of observational studies. Objective 1 is to distinguish between a randomized experiment and an observational study. The terminology that we're going to use here are experimental units, which are individuals who are studied. These can be people, animals, plants, or things. When the experimental units are people, we often refer to them as subjects. The outcome or response is what is measured on each of the experimental units or subjects. The treatments are the procedures applied to each experimental unit. For example, in medical research, we may want to determine what treatment is most effective for lowering cholesterol. So we could have three groups of people, one that are given a drug, one that are given an exercise and diet regimen, and another group that are given no instructions to change anything. That group with no instructions to change anything is what we call our control group. The treatment then will either be the medicine, the exercise and diet, or nothing. And then we measure the outcome on the individual patients, which would be their cholesterol level at the end of a period of time. For this example, we're asked to suppose that scientists want to determine which of the three types of seeds will result in the largest wheat yield. The study is conducted as follows. We prepare three identically sized plots of land with similar soil types. We plant each type of seed on a different plot, choosing the plots at random, so that there is randomization involved. Water and fertilize the plots in the same way, harvest the wheat, and then measure the amount of growth on each plot. If one type of seed produces substantially more or less wheat than the others, then that one is clearly better or worse than the others. In this example, what would be our experimental units? The temptation here may be to say that the seeds are the experimental units because that's what we're investigating, trying to see which is better. In actuality, the plots of land would be the experimental unit. The treatment then would be the three different types of seeds. And then the outcome that we're measuring would be the crop yield. Let's compare this to the medical research problem that I mentioned previously. If we're trying to determine what would best lower cholesterol, a medicine, diet and exercise, or nothing, these would be the treatments. We perform these treatments on our experimental units, which we call patients. And then our outcome is measured as the cholesterol level. In this experiment over here, we wanted to determine which seeds produced the best outcome. Well, do you see how the seeds relate to the treatment in the medical experiment? We want to know which of these produced the best outcome for cholesterol level. Well, we want to know which seeds produced the best outcome for crop yield, which means that the only thing left for the experimental units would be the plot of land. We plant seeds in the land just like we either give medicine or diet and exercise to patients. So hopefully this helps you identify what the experimental unit's treatments and outcome are by looking at a parallel medical procedure. Next we have a randomized experiment definition. A randomized experiment is a study in which the investigator assigns treatments to the experimental units at random. For example, to assess the effectiveness of a new method for teaching arithmetic to elementary school children, a simple random sample of 31st graders were taught with the new method, and another simple random sample of 31st graders were taught with the currently used method. At the end of eight weeks, the children were given a test to assess their knowledge. The treatments in this experiment would be the two methods of teaching. This is a randomized experiment because the children were assigned to the treatment groups randomly. We know they were assigned randomly because they used a simple random sample. Why would we want to do that? What if the principal of the school said, you can go into this school and pick two classrooms to use for your teaching method experiment? Let's say you walk down the hall, you stick your head in a classroom and tell the teacher, 
your class is going to be using this new teaching method to teach arithmetic and then we're going to give your students a test at the end of six weeks and see how they perform. Well, if that classroom happens to be the GT classroom for first graders, you've already introduced something called bias into the experiment because now you've got the best and the brightest first graders that probably have the higher IQs. And you continue walking down the hall and the next classroom you stick your head in for your control group, the group that get taught with the current teaching method, happens to be the resource classroom. Already you've set yourself up for a confounding problem because the resource students typically have lower IQs and do not perform as well on school activities. So if you don't use a random sample, then you've introduced bias just simply by choosing those two particular classrooms. Now granted, this is an extreme example, but we already know what the outcome is going to be. The GT students will test higher than the resource students no matter what teaching method you use. In this case, we would say that IQ scores would be a confounding variable. That's why you want to be sure to use randomization in your experiment. It would have been better to use the random sample because then in any group of 30 first graders you may have some with higher IQs and some with lower IQs but they should be spread out evenly or at least randomly among the two groups with very little difference between the average IQs. An observational study is one in which the assignment to a treatment group is not made by the investigator. For example, a study is performed to determine how smoking affects people's health. A group of smokers and a group of non-smokers are observed for several years. Scientists observe differences in health outcomes between the groups of smokers and non-smokers. Here you're not assigning individuals to groups of smokers or non-smokers because that would be unethical. You wouldn't want to take a group of a hundred people and say, okay, you 50 are going to be in my smoking group, you 50 are going to be in my non-smoking group. If you're in the smoking group and you don't smoke, you have to start now. If you've been assigned to the non-smoking group and you do smoke, you need to stop now. People just aren't going to do that. So that's why when we're studying things like behavior, we assign people to observe based on current behaviors that they already possess. Objective two is understanding the advantages of randomized experiments. Why do we want to randomize? In a perfect study, treatment groups would not differ from each other in any important way, except that they receive different treatments. In practice, however, it's impossible to construct treatment groups that are exactly alike, but randomization does the next best thing. In a randomized experiment, small differences among treatment groups are likely to be due only to chance. If there are large differences in outcomes among the treatment groups, we can conclude then that the differences are due to treatments. Think about the example that we discussed earlier where we're using the teaching method as our treatment. When I take a randomized group of first graders, some in the treatment group will have higher IQs and some will have lower IQs. In my control group that's using the existing or current treatment method, I will have students with higher IQs and lower IQs but on average their IQs should be about the same. There may be some differences, but those differences will be small. If there's a large difference in the outcome among the treatment groups, for example, if the new teaching method yielded students who could pass the test at a higher rate than the students who were taught using the current method, then I would conclude that the new teaching method was effective. In this example, we're told that in July 2008, scientists reported the results of a study to determine whether a new drug called raltzegravir is effective in reducing levels of virus in patients with HIV. These patients were divided into two groups, where one group was given raltzegravir and the other was given a placebo. Does everybody know what a placebo is? A placebo is something that looks, tastes, smells exactly like the treatment it just doesn't have the active ingredient. So for example, if the treatment were an IV, the placebo would also be an IV, it just wouldn't have the active ingredient in the medication. If the treatment were a blue pill, then the placebo would also be a blue pill. In the Raltogravir group, 62% of the subjects had reduced levels of virus, but only 35% of the placebo group did. 
This is an almost 30 point difference between the placebo group, remember they did not receive the active medication, and the treatment group. Because this study was a randomized experiment, it's then reasonable to conclude that the difference was actually due to the raltegravir. That's what this statement right here means. If there are large differences in outcome among the treatment groups, we can conclude that the differences are due to the treatment. In this experiment, if the raltegravir subjects had only had, say, a 37% reduced level of virus, that's too close to the 35% from the placebo group, so we wouldn't be able to conclude that the raltegravir made much of a difference. So if the treatment group had a 37% reduced virus instead of the 62%, we would not be able to conclude that the treatment was effective because 37% is too close to the 35% that we got from the control group or the group that received the placebo. Often in medical research we use what's called a double-blind experiment. An experiment that is double-blinded means that neither the investigator nor the subject knows who has been assigned to which treatment. When investigators or subjects know which treatment is being given, they may tend to report the results differently. Therefore, experiments should be double-blinded whenever possible. In medical research, you often want to double-blind experiments because if the physician knows which patient is receiving the treatment and which one's receiving the placebo, their body language may subconsciously indicate to the subject that, hey, you're getting the treatment, you should be getting better. And so then you could introduce what's called a psychosomatic effect, which is probably why there was a 35% decrease in the virus from the control group in the example above. A psychosomatic effect is when the body heals itself because the mind tells the body you should be getting better. And since a large portion of communication is nonverbal communication or body language, it's best if the physician doesn't know who's getting the treatment because then their body language cannot convey to the patient you should be getting better. And that yields a more valid or reliable result from the experiment. Objective three is understanding how confounding can affect results of an observational study. Confounding is what happens whenever you end up getting the results due not from the treatment that you're trying to measure, but because of some outside influence that's interfering. Usually this outside influence you did not take into account and haven't made controls for. Imagine the observational study that is intended to determine whether smoking increases the risk of heart attack. A group of smokers and non-smokers are observed for several years, and during that time, a higher percentage of the smoking group experience a heart attack. One problem with this type of study is that smoking groups will differ from the non-smoking groups in many ways other than smoking. For example, smoking is more prevalent among men. Heart attacks are also more prevalent among men. And since the smoking group contains a higher percentage of men than the non-smoking group, they should also experience a higher rate of heart attacks in the smoking group. And that may be due to the fact that there are more men in that group and not due to the fact of the smoking itself. In this event, gender would be a confounding variable because gender affects heart attacks and the gender makeup of the two groups were different. Confounding. The preceding example illustrates a major problem with observational studies. It's difficult to tell whether a difference in an outcome is due to the treatment or to some other difference between the treatment and control groups. This difference is known as confounding. In the smoking example, gender was a confounder. Gender is related to smoking and men are more likely to smoke. And to heart attacks. Men are more likely to have heart attacks. For this reason, it was impossible to determine whether the difference in heart attack rates was due to the differences in smoking, the treatment, or in gender, the confounder. Here's another example problem. In an observational study of the effects of blood pressure on health, a large group of people of all ages were given regular blood pressure checkups for a period of one year. It was found that people with high blood pressure were more likely to develop cancer than people with lower blood pressure. Explain how this result might be due to confounding. Well, think about the age group of people that have trouble with blood pressure. Aren't they generally older? And since this group contained people of all ages, older people were more likely to have high blood pressure. 
also older people are more likely to develop cancer so in this example we're not sure if the high blood pressure led to the cancer or the age led to the cancer we would say here that age is a confounding variable the last objective in this section tells us that we will learn how to describe various types of observational studies there are two main types of observational studies cohort studies and case control studies cohort studies well let's start by defining what a cohort is a cohort is just a group of subjects that can be classified or grouped together because they share some common trait cohort studies can be further divided into prospective cross-sectional or retrospective studies these three different types of studies have to do with time a prospective study looks into the future we take a group of students and we follow them into the future and see how many of them graduate a cross-sectional study just looks at one point in time like a snapshot a retrospective study looks back into the past and whatever's happened happened in the past and then you make your observation on what the results are today in a cohort study a group of subjects is studied to determine whether various factors of interest are associated with an outcome a prospective cohort study is one where the subjects are followed over time one of the most famous prospective cohort studies is the Framingham Heart Study this study began in 1948 with 5,209 men and women from the town of Framingham, Massachusetts. Every two years, these subjects were given physical exams and lifestyle interviews, which are studied to discover factors that increase the risk of heart disease. A cross-sectional cohort study is one where measurements are taken at one point in time. An example of a cross-sectional cohort study is a study published in the Journal of American Medical Association by I. Lang and colleagues. They studied the health effects of bisphenol A, a chemical found in the linings of food and beverage containers. They measured the levels of bisphenol A in urine samples from 1,455 adults, and they found that people with higher levels of bisphenol A were more likely to have heart disease and diabetes. They just looked at this cohort of people at one point in time. In a retrospective cohort study, subjects are sampled after the outcome has occurred. For example, in a study published in the New England Journal of Medicine, T. Adams and colleagues sampled 9,949 people who had undergone gastric bypass surgery between 5 and 15 years previously, along with 9,668 obese patients who had not had bypass surgery. They looked back in time to see which patients were still alive today. The subjects were either obese and not had surgery or obese and had surgery 5 to 15 years ago and then we look and see today are they still alive they found that the survival rates for the surgery patients were greater than for those who had not undergone surgery in a case control study two samples are drawn one sample consists of people who have the disease of interest these are the cases and the other consists of people who do not have the disease these are the controls the investigators look back in time to determine whether a factor of interest differs between the two groups. S.S. Nielsen and colleagues conducted a case control study to determine whether exposure to pesticides is related to brain cancer in children. They sampled 201 children who had been diagnosed with brain cancer and 285 children who did not have brain cancer. They interviewed the parents of the children to determine the extent to which the children had been exposed to pesticides they did not find a clear relationship between pesticide exposure and brain cancer you don't want to confuse case control studies with retrospective studies in the case control studies the experimental units were assigned based on whether or not they had the disease today and then we looked in the past to see what factors might have caused that disease today in a retrospective study, the patients were either obese and had gastric bypass surgery or were obese and did not have gastric bypass surgery 5 to 15 years ago. Then we look today to see who's still alive. So in a retrospective study, events occurred in the past. In the case control study, the people have the disease today or don't have the disease today. And we look to the past for a possible cause for the disease today any common occurrence or exposure between the two groups the case and the control group at the end of this section you should know 
the difference between a randomized experiment and an observational study. In a randomized experiment, some treatment is performed to subjects that are randomly assigned to groups. In an observational study, you don't perform a treatment or interact with the subject, other than maybe giving them a survey, and the subjects are assigned to groups based on their behaviors today. The advantages of randomized experiments are that it can minimize confounding. What it means for an experiment to be double-blind is that neither the patient nor the researcher knows who's receiving a treatment and who's receiving a placebo. Confounding can affect the results of an observational study because an unplanned for or unintended variable can influence the measured outcome on the variables or on the experimental units. The various types of observational studies, we have prospective, looking into the future, cross-sectional, which is a snapshot at one point in time, and retrospective, which is looking into the past. We also have case control studies, where the case has the disease, the control group does not. And this wraps up section 1.3.